Hi everybody and welcome back to my channel. So in this video today we're going to be talking about sperm. Uh, <laughs> and so specifically where do you get it? Where do you get sperm? So I just gave a talk to the insemination group at the LGBTQ Center in Manhattan with my own midwife, Gina, um, from Community Midwifery. And in that session, one of the topics that kept coming up was, where do you get sperm? What are you looking for when you are looking to buy sperm or asking a donor to, to give you sperm? How much does it cost? What does the process entail? What are your options? All of that good stuff. So I thought this is a really, really interesting topic for those of you who are in the early stages of trying to conceive and thinking about what your options are. And this is also a really interesting topic, I hope, for those of you who are just learning about queer conception and, and what that might entail, in this case specifically for people with uteruses. So that'll be the point of this video, and I hope you enjoy! Okay. So if you are a queer family where one or both of you have a uterus and you're thinking about getting donor sperm, the first question to ask yourself is, do I want to go with someone who is a known donor, so a friend or a family member, or do I want to go with an unknown donor? With known donors, typically known donors are, it means that it's someone that you know, so typically they are friends. Um, who will either decide to eventually help you parent that child, will be viewed as dad or mom or however they identify, um, but they will be viewed as a parent or an uncle or a family member, or there's someone who are offering you their sperm with the understanding from both of you that they will not be involved in that relationship with you. A known donor typically will donate sperm privately or through a sperm bank. So if they donate sperm privately, that means that they will give you the sperm directly from their body, either in your home, or they will ejaculate. I shouldn't be laughing. They will ejaculate uh, at their own in their own home and then bring the sperm over to you if they're close enough and the timing is right. If that known donor decides to go through a sperm bank, there are a few different things that they have to do. So if they go through a sperm bank, they will have to have a psychological evaluation. They will also have to go through a physical ex evaluation or exam, so to test for any genetic diseases, STIs, HIV, AIDS, any of those things, genetic markers that might be incompatible with your genetic markers, right, all of that. They will also probably, um, usually that the sperm that they donate also has to go through evaluation as well, and typically it also goes through, so the sperm itself, once it is donated to the sperm bank and you've been approved, um, will need to be quarantined for six months. Now, sometimes if you have a midwife or an OBGYN, or sometimes you, depending on the sperm bank, can sign off on um, the release of that sperm so that it can be released to you at an earlier date. So that can be really difficult if you're hoping to try conceiving tomorrow and then you, your donor has to go through all of these examinations uh, prior to and then also there's that six months quarantine period. So if you're thinking about a known donor, I think it's really important that you think to yourself, you know, well, when is it that I want to try, when do I want to try to conceive, right? The other thing to know with um, known donor donation are the fees that are involved. So all of those examinations, the psychological examination, the semen analysis and quarantine, the um, storage of the sperm, if it's accept I keep using accepted, um, all of that is something that would need to be paid for. I know that the bank that we use, I think they charge about like 100 or 300 or, or whatnot for each one of those categories. Um, I think maybe it's like $50 a month or something like that to actually store each vial. But I'm not, oh no, to store a big quantity? I don't know, I have to look into it. I'll put the link to some of the sperm banks below so you guys can look into it if you want to on your own. 
Another legal uh, or another fee is a legal fee. So if you're going with a known donor, an important thing to, to know is if you do not want that person to have any legal custody over that child, then that person, the donor, will have to relinquish legal custody after the birth of the child, right? So they cannot relinquish custody when they donate, they relinquish it afterwards. Legally, it makes, and, and the reason for that is that, you know, the law says that they can't really prove that this person didn't want to be involved in this child's life if it's just donated in your home. It's a little bit different if you go through a sperm bank because there was kind of this legal recognition that you're donating to a bank and someone else is going to use it, but it is still very, very much recommended that you go through um, kind of legal counsel to figure out what your laws are and what your options are. So that is some information on known donor and next we will talk about unknown donors through sperm banks. Okay, so unknown donors via sperm banks. Most of the people that I know tend to go, or most of the people that I know tend to go to sperm banks to get unknown donors. Uh, although I have heard of some people going through like online forums or asking friends of friends who they don't know, um, but that kind of somewhat goes back into that known donor category. Um, however, the donors who donate at sperm banks go through extensive evaluations before they are approved to even donate. I believe that they have to, you know, they have to go through the same like genetic testing, blood testing, they have to know the history of like their family's medical history, all of that stuff. They know a lot more about themselves and their history than I know about my own history. So, you know, it's really only, I don't know what the exact percentage is, but really only a very small percentage of people who, who apply to donate to a sperm bank actually are accepted into the sperm bank. When you go to a sperm bank, you are given kind of a catalog, either online or it's physically, you can order one, it's physically printed and mailed to you. And in that catalog, catalog you can choose from people based on a variety of categories. So one of the main categories is whether or not you want that donor, that unknown donor to be completely anonymous, meaning when that child turns 18 or 21, you like you will not know who that person is you have no contact with that person or you can choose someone who is eventually willing to be known when that child turns 18 or 21 and I say 18 or 21 because it really varies depending on the bank we used one bank once where it was like 21 and another where it was 18 and so that I think is a really great starting point if anyone is thinking about going with an unknown uh, an unknown donor through a sperm bank, a great starting point is to think about like, well, do I want this child to eventually be able to reach out to that donor or not, right? So in terms of options, so you can choose donors based on many different categories or characteristics, such as race, nationality, education level, blood type, weight, height, body frame, religious background, an ethnic background, uh, eye color, hair color, right? So there are lots of different categories. Generally, or my experience has been that once you limit from anonymous, willing to be known and anonymous, that narrows down your pool. If you narrow down by race or religion, that also narrows down your pool and you end up having kind of a small selection. Um, and then you have other options as well. So you beyond that beyond once you've kind of figured out those categories that fit you and your family uh, or the family that you would like to create many sperm banks also then have uh, additional kind of detailed profiles of those donors so in those detailed profiles you have things like family medical history so what do their great grandparents die from or their grandparents or um well ho hopefully nobody died that was a horrible thing to say. Nobody died. Um, but what, what medical history? Do they have cancer? Do they have asthma? Do they have just diabetes? Um, you also get to see like statements on why they chose to donate. And I thought it was really cool, or we thought it was really cool, that you could actually sometimes 
see their handwriting and see how they wrote and and you get to actually kind of see who they are through what they write. Um, they also might write about their favorite music and food and favorite places to travel, um, aspirations that they have for their future and their life. Sometimes you also might be able to get childhood pictures. Some banks will even have adult pictures so that you know you can see if that feels like a good match for you. And it seems like a lot of information and it is a lot of information, but just remember that a lot of people or you might be thinking about, you know, creating a child who looks like your partner if you have a partner involved or creating a child who looks like yourself maybe you know I, who knows um, I know for myself it was really interesting to be able to see you know the aspirations that people had for their life especially if you're going with someone who hope is willing to be known later on I really wanted someone who I felt like I could connect with and who if I had a child with that donor who I felt like they could connect with based on the way that I envisioned raising a child right not not that they're necessarily gonna be best friends or or um, feel like they're each other's family but just being able to have a nice conversation with a person after 10 minutes um, of meeting them right is is really important to me and I think can be important to other people but that's not the that's not the only reason why people choose who they choose in sperm banks in terms of the cost the fee to go through sperm bank to get sperm through a sperm bank can range anywhere from three hundred and fifty dollars at the lowest 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 end it's rare to find for unwashed sperm which I'll explain in another video uh, all the way to, on average, about $1,000 for um, IUI, which is, in, oh, sorry, for uh, washed sperm, which is typically used for IUI, which, again, I will explain in another video. In terms of the legality of it, um, and oh, actually, going back to the fees, it's generally, generally recommended that you use about two vials per try. So it's not that you're paying just $350 or $1,000, it's that you're, you are actually paying $700 or $2, to $2,000 per try. So and each try is once, right? So you try one, one time each month or twice each month. Um, in terms of the legality, if you're going through a sperm bank, that legal, the custody has already been relinquished, so that's not the same issue as if you're going with a known donor. Um, so yeah, so I think, you know, the most important thing for families to think about and probably the most important thing that families are thinking about is whether or not they want a donor who is someone that they know who's either going to be involved or not, right? Or if they want someone or if you want someone who is anonymous, completely anonymous or someone who's willing to be known when that child turns 18. That's kind of a really good starting point. So. I hope you've all learned something new, something helpful, something useful. Um, in my next video, I will talk a bit more about the options for insemination and conception and how that might impact a person's decision in choosing sperm. I always continue to welcome suggestions and ideas. And in the meantime, please like this video if you liked it and subscribe. Bye, everybody.